There once was a man named Paul. And well, you know how sometimes pastors or speakers will mention someone in the Bible or they'll mention a story by saying something like, now you all know about. Sometimes that's fine, but it always stands out to me because so many times I've been that person in the audience sitting there thinking, I have no idea what they're talking about. But with that said, I'm going to continue. There once was a man named Paul who had once severely persecuted Christians until God drastically intervened in his life and saved him. By God's will, Paul became a faithful apostle of Christ. We're going to look at a letter that Paul wrote, but I want to first say that I never used to feel like I could truly study and comprehend the Bible, you know, not like other people I compared myself with. That is, like, not until I did this study on 2 Timothy and I realized that all I needed was some confidence and a lot of dedication. There's a famous saying that's been changed over the centuries, but goes something like this. The scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning, and deep enough for theologians to swim in without ever touching the bottom. While awaiting trial in Rome where he had been arrested for preaching the gospel, Paul remembers his fellow worker Timothy, whom he had instructed to stay in Ephesus and preach because many people in the Ephesian church had become unsound, promoting controversies and teaching false doctrines and myths. Paul had played a significant role in Timothy's theological foundations, and so, as he anticipated the outcome of his trial, he wrote to Timothy to encourage him to also faithfully follow Christ and to live his life according to scripture. I like that Paul wasn't all like, hey, get out of that place, Timothy, but rather he tells Timothy to stay. I think that shows Paul's confidence in Timothy's faith and their dedication to spreading the gospel. Now here's my best breakdown of 2 Timothy if you're short on time. Paul used this letter, the last of his letters, to empower Timothy to continue in his faith, to become a holy, faithful vessel, to avoid the ungodly in the last days, and to live by scripture in the last days, ending with final instructions and wisdom. So now you get an idea of what 2 Timothy is all about, just like you can kind of tell what this puzzle is, but hey, the details are missing. So why not stick around a little longer? Before I go on, I want to also give you a time frame for this. So 2 Timothy was most likely written during the fall of 67 AD. 1 and 2 Peter and Hebrews were also written around this time. When I study the Bible, I can get stuck on different opinions that scholars have for dating different texts. I think it's okay to just find a range of years that's generally accepted and then move on. So as one who'd been fulfilling God's will for his life, Paul writes to this younger Christian Timothy to encourage him and give him insights based on his knowledge and experiences. Paul's already taught Timothy everything that he's writing to tell him. He simply wants to encourage Timothy to continue in the pattern of sound teaching that he's familiar with. Now that he's on the receiving end of the persecutions which he used to be a part of administering, Paul reminds Timothy that this message of the gospel is worth suffering for, all because of Jesus Christ. This is a major theme in this letter. Using the Greek words synkakapeo and kakapeo, Paul repeatedly conveys the idea that the gospel is worth enduring hardships for, and those who suffer for it are not alone in their hardships, for anyone who preaches the gospel will experience suffering. This word, kakapeo, can also be found in Jonah 4, where God talks to Jonah about the troubles which frustrate him and in James 5, where James, the brother of Jesus, says that the thing to do when one is suffering hardships is to pray. And, okay, okay, so I wasn't gonna include this, but I have to, I have to. Okay, so I wanna break down this word, synkakapatheo, so just bear with me for a bit. If you wanna look it up, the Strong's number for this word is G4777, and it's made up of the word sun, which means with, and the word kakapatheo, which gets translated to something like endure or undergo hardships. But get this, Paul actually coined this word. If that sounds a little doll-esque, it's not. He wasn't totally making up words, these were just two words that he combined into one. Kind of like how Shakespeare would add a prefix or a suffix onto a word, so it's something new but everyone understands the meaning. The Greek that Paul wrote in was an agglutinative language generally, but I thought this was interesting. He used or simply created like quite a number of these sun words, often to emphasize the unity and intimacy that Christians have with Christ. But here with sun kakopatheo, Paul is emphasizing that Christians are never alone in their sufferings. They suffer with Christ and alongside other believers. Paul knows how necessary it is to endure hardships for the sake of bringing people to Christ and to live and reign with Christ. Paul's going to change up his language a little bit now to use the Greek word hepamena. I should look that up. I don't know how to say that. Strong's G, 5278. Hupameno. Hupameno. Yeah, okay, I was off. <laughs> to use the Greek word hupameno when he stresses enduring sufferings for Christ. In this ancient Greek culture, this word had a virtuous connotation to it. It was to actively endure something for the sake of love and honor, regardless of the opinions of others. It also happens to be the word that Paul used in Romans 12, 12, which says, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Paul wants Timothy to face persecutions with Christ and other believers, being unashamed of the gospel with a holy motivation to stay faithful not only to Paul, but to Christ and his message. Paul gives Timothy clear instructions on how to uphold the truth to God's standards, but this truth is not meant exclusively for Paul and Timothy. Timothy is to preach it so that others, even his opponents, can receive God's truth and be saved. Timothy was entirely familiar with Paul's way of life and his teachings because Paul had taken him with him on his missionary journeys. 
Timothy had been alongside Paul preaching in Rome and had even joined Paul in teaching and correcting churches through many of his letters. Paul wants Timothy to continue in the lifestyle and faith which he had modeled for him, not the lifestyles and teachings of those around him or the ungodly in the last days. Having preached in Ephesus, Paul would have known the difficulties Timothy was facing and would continue to undergo the more he boldly proclaimed the gospel. With persecutions from Jews offended by Christ, and by Gentiles to whom the gospel would have threatened their culture and their economies surrounding the Ephesian temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. From the experiences he endured, Paul had become convinced of God's continued faithfulness despite circumstances and sufferings. I think it's pretty incredible when someone can go through terrible things and still run to God, instead of blaming God or assuming their experiences mean that God doesn't exist. Paul wants Timothy to know that this godly life that he's being instructed to live will involve persecution. Persecutions being a sign that Timothy is on the right track in his faith. We're going to take a closer look at the end of this letter now, where Paul gives Timothy a charge, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. This word charge here is intense. It contains the group, the group, <laughs> the Greek, the Greek word, the Greek, the Greek root. It contains the Greek root, it contains the Greek root, and expresses the gravity of making an oath with God as your witness, to preach whenever the opportunity occurs, even when it may seem to Timothy to be an inopportune time. So Timothy had a Jewish mother and a Greek father, so growing up with both cultures, he would have been easily accepted in Jewish synagogues and Gentile communities, giving him a broad audience to share the gospel with. Paul rehashes a point he made in a previous letter to Timothy that a time is coming when people will only listen to teachers who say what they want to hear, not wanting to endure or put up with the truth. But for the sake of those who may be saved, Timothy is to have patience in preaching, though his audience may take to his teaching slowly. His preaching is necessary with Christ's coming return and judgment. Timothy is not only charged to preach, but to also correct, rebuke, and reprove. His ministry isn't full if he's not engaging in all three of these assignments. Once again, Timothy is reminded that his work as an evangelist, a role he knows well at this point, will bring hardships which he must endure. Timothy is being told to fulfill all of these responsibilities because his work is not done, whereas Paul has fulfilled his ministry. Now with his work finished, Paul looks forward to Christ, the judge, who is going to award him, along with others, with a crown representing his life lived to honor God, a crown which Timothy will be rewarded with too if he continues to be faithful to Christ. Paul longed for Christ's return, and this was a significant part of his message that he preached along with Timothy. With Christ's approaching return and the judgment that he would bring, ending hardships and rewarding faithful believers, Paul was fully motivated for a life preaching the gospel, and he wanted this to be a motivation for Timothy. After this, Paul ends his letter practically, making final comments with news about his ministry, specific tasks for Timothy, and passing along greetings as a way of keeping the Christians who were with Paul united to those in Ephesus. By the end of reading this letter, Timothy should feel encouraged and emboldened being fully equipped for anything God has for him to do, because he spent time devoting himself to learning the scriptures, and he has all he needs to endure as a faithful follower of Christ, preaching the gospel.